Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 194 of the Masterclass Podcast. My name is Cam Brennan, and I am joined by Dave Hogue. What's up, man? Hey. Um, what's up? You know, just, uh, we're still kind of in transition over here, so we're, um, Hoping to get settled in December in our new house. Oh, still got a few weeks, huh? And so, yeah. So, yeah. We're never. Uh, I guess we're we're still in transition. <laughs> yeah, <and> that's always <laughs> August. That's, that's always a uh, what's the word? Um, un, I mean, unsettled time, right? Because you're you're kind of half living in boxes and, you know, anticipating the the change yes. and, you know, I mean, you've obviously been, been through it before, but it's, yeah, I can, I can appreciate the desire to be settled. Well, and that's, sure. you know, we, we, we're in an apartment and we were willing to be here for up to a year. And when it's all said and done, we're going to end up being, um, about four and a half months in an apartment versus the year. Yeah, well, that's a, so that's a good bet. It's really not quite as bad as it could be, but right. But when you're when you've when, you know you signed the deal and you know it's just the the anticipation. You know, I can understand that for sure. Yes, but we're doing well. So and we are not doing anything. Well, we're actually going out to dinner for Thanksgiving. <laughs> and my wife is very excited for us to be somewhat settled for Christmas. So mm-hmm. that'll be nice. Yeah. Very good. How are things in your world? Uh, Generally. Pretty calm. Which honestly, I will take. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? Based on based on the last couple of years, uh yeah, things are the water, you know, to use an analogy, has a nice natural ebb and flow to it. It's not yeah, it's not crazy waves, it's not eerily still. Like life is just life right now. And I'm okay with that. There's there's nothing rocking the boat too bad. Um there may be some things that rock the boat coming up here in a little bit, but you know, that's all to be determined. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just like, I was home this past weekend, um, for my grandmother's memorial service. Um, she passed away, uh, I guess eight days ago now. Um, And everyone kept asking me how I was because of all the things that have gone on. And like, I'm good. <laughs> and like, I, I really didn't have much of a relationship with my grandma that, that passed these last mm-hmm. 12 or 13 years. In fact, I hadn't seen or spoken to her in almost three years. Um, so the only reason I went home was to be there for my dad. Um, because right. both my sisters live even further away from home than I do. Um, like, plane ride requirement travel. Um, and neither of them were able to make it home for the the service. So I I drove the five hours and it was, you know, it was good to be home and everything, but like, yeah, it was just one of those things where it was like, it was weird being at the memorial service. Cause like I was the only emotion I had was empathy for the family members that were really upset. Sure. Um, because like I said, they're just, they're, there was not a relationship there these last, you know, 13 years or however long it's been, mm-hmm. maybe even longer. I left the house at 17. I'm 35. So that's 18 years. Um, so yeah, somewhere between 18 and 13 years ago, our relationship pretty much just stopped existing. Um, which is a, which is, you know, I guess sad in and of itself. Um, but that's just kind of how it was with her you were either in or you were out and and those that were in had a very, very different experience than those that were out. 
uh, and that was very evident at the memorial service based on the different speeches and stories oh, that were shared. Uh, like my dad gave the eulogy, and it was very unemotional and terse. And then we heard stories from the people that were in and not out. And it was as if they were talking about a completely different person. Um, and so that was an interesting emotional ride, uh, more so because of how it affected my dad and watching him react to some of that, because there's just lots of history there of sure. hurt and, uh, nastiness. So I'm glad that I got to go, um, you know, and just be there and see my cousins and my aunts and my uncles and, you know, all of that. But, um, just really, it, it actually served to solidify my lack of emotion about the whole thing because it made it, it cemented the fact that I was out and had been out for sure. a long time. Um, so it was a very interesting. Um, but like, yeah, like even that, like that included, like things are just kind of like cruising right now, which is, which is nice. And I don't know if that makes me sound like a sociopath or not, but I promise I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, but hey, you know, uh, also college basketball is back, which makes me very happy. Michigan is two and zero oh against nice. two teams they should have beaten, and they play Seton Hall tonight. So I will be watching that after we record. And uh, uh. I just, Dave, I just, I really like college basketball, <laughs> and I really, really dislike the NBA. It's. <laughs> My 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 feelings for the two could could hardly be more uh, opposite. So, you know, I'm it, it, it's yeah, it's just I love this time of year. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess, in the roundabout way. Yeah, it's just a good good time, and I love the weather and the leaves and all yeah. the details. You know, bonfires and warm coffee and mold wine. Dave, have you had mold wine? Mold. M U L L E D. Mold no. wine. Oh, I'm about to change your life, man. <laughs> so it's a German thing. It's it's like red wine that's uh you know made with like cinnamon and orange and cloves, and you heat oh, it. Sure. You heat I've it up. That, yeah. yeah, you heat it up and you drink it out of a coffee mug. Yes. Oh, it's so good. But I don't think that's what we called it. <laughs> What did you call it? I have no idea. Like the German name is <laughs> is Glühwein, but that sounds disgusting. Mold wine sounds much more appetizing. <laughs> sure. Anyways, I'm just saying if you're if you're of age and of a temperament to handle alcohol wisely, then I suggest uh, you try some. That's all I'm saying. All right. Which you are both of those things. So. Mm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why that made me laugh so much, but it did. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you can get it at Aldi, that's all I'm saying. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not sure our Aldi does, but... Well, or you, I mean, you can make your own, or you can buy it pre-made at Aldi and just heat it up. I will check at Aldi. It comes in, like, boxes of six. It's, uh, it's quite good. Any who's keys. That's uh, been uh that's been a survey of Cam's favorite fall things. We will uh, come <laughs> back to that next year. And I think we're gonna continue in Hebrews chapter eleven. We're gonna do verses what, seven through sixteen, correct? That is correct. Yes. Do you want? Yeah, do you want to jump in? Oh, oh uh, what? Do you, do you want me to read? Yes, yes, that's what I wanted <laughs> you to do, please. All right, so Hebrews 11, 7 through 16. By faith, Noah, being warned by God, 
concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear construct an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has found that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. All right, well, that's uh, clear as mud. So, okay, so we got Noah, we got Abraham, yep. Yep. we got Sarah, and then we got this sort of conclusion here at the end. Mm-hmm. I guess let's start with Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. I'm reading this for my own benefit, Dave. I've now read this multiple times, and I'm still struggling. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness. Okay, so last episode we talked about the first six verses, right? This idea that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then we hop forward and by faith. So by this assurance of things hoped for and this, this conviction of things not seen, Noah out of fear constructs an ark for the saving of his household. Now this is well, well illustrated in Evan almighty. You've seen that, right? With Steve Carell. Yes. Where he builds the giant ark and everyone makes fun of him. And then the river floods and you know, He's fine. Not necessarily the most uh, accurate film biblically, but. Nor is it accurate geographically for what Washington, D.C. looks like. <laughs> well, there's there's that slight issue, too. But what I think what what could potentially be accurate is the ridiculousness of the whole thing. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly. I think they nailed on. that part. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a ridiculousness that goes with this request being made of Noah, and and I think what it what it boils down to is, you know, Noah lived in a place where the where the need or use of an ark didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the concept of the of the entire earth, or at least regionally, their entire area of the earth flooding just was not something was not a concept they were they didn't deal with floods, you know. It was yeah. not a, a, a normal occurrence for them. So they had all the downsides of sand with none of the positives of a beach, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. But I guess this is the point, right? That faith is not always something that makes sense to those that don't have it. And this is where it gets very, uh, I don't know if tricky is the right word that I want to use, but we'll go with it, right? Like, you know, people that, that 
don't believe that are not saved, um, that believe that everything can be explained logically and scientifically, struggle hard with this concept of faith, right? Assurance of things that are hoped for, conviction of things that are not seen. And Noah's a great example of that, right? To your point, he's building a boat in a place where water is scarce. And the need for a boat to navigate said water is unheard of. So there's something inherent in faith, in the faith that that we're called to, to, what's the word? Um, To like be okay with the dissonance, if that makes sense. Um, I'm really struggling to wrap to wrap my words around what I'm trying to say, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> Usually I can't shut up, but I'm really <laughs> struggling with this one. I guess the, the, the idea is like, if it were predictable and easy, then it wouldn't require us to believe in something greater, right? Mm-hmm. Like if all Noah had to do was just build a boat because he knew he had to build a boat because it was going to be rainy season, then everyone would have been building a boat. But because he was the only one to do it, because God calls him to do something that didn't make logical, scientific sense, it required faith. You know, I'm thinking of like Indiana Jones stepping out under that like invisible bridge, right? Sure. It sure didn't make scientific or logical sense to do it, but it felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, am I making any sense? Yeah. And so I guess, so the part of this for me that, like, I guess I have a struggle with or I don't have a, a, a grasp of is, you know, Genesis tells us that God tells Noah to build this ark. Mm-hmm. And every indication that I have is that, you know, Noah was a righteous man. He walked with God. He had a very, you know, we talked last week, early chapters of Genesis. And so we're still in the very early chapters of Genesis. So early on in creation, uh, I don't have a complete grasp of what kind of relationship Noah had with God, but I'm guessing to some degree it was a a fairly pure relationship. And so it talks about faith in this. And so uh, the part that I'm curious about is like, did, did Noah question, was he hearing God? You know, because because the story is presented in a way where it feels like Noah gets a very clear message from God, and not only does he get like kind of this message of build an ark, but he t- he gets the plans for it. <laughs> you know, yeah, and 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 I guess in my life, I don't feel like I have ever heard from God to the point of Him telling me, "This is what I want you to do." Oh, and by the way. Here's here are the exact measurements. Here are the exact plans yeah. for how I want you to do something. And so, um, so there's an element for me of you know, if Noah was this man of God, and he hears from God, and God gives him very specific design for how to build this ark, like as off the wall as it may seem it seems like it shouldn't be this huge leap of faith for Noah. Hmm. And maybe that's not fair on my part. And maybe I'm, I'm putting my own experience onto him that, that I shouldn't be, but you know, Noah kind of gives him this, like he gives him the plan for the ark. 
um, I don't remember exactly what it is, but I mean, he gets cubits and measurements and yeah, all that sort of stuff. And then there's kind of the whole take with you. There's two of every kind of animal, but then I think when it comes to clean animals, there's seven pairs of each kind of animal or something like that. And, you know, we always talk about Noah and two by two. Yep. But there's also a, for the clean animals, it was seven pairs or something like that. So anyway, um, clearly there is an omen of faith for this four Noah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Like I, I and sorry, you go know, ahead. God tells him what he's going to do, and Noah does it and is obedient to it, and he takes him and his wife and his three sons or two sons. Two and a half. They were a proper American family. Why pick a fence? Two and a half kids. <laughs> oh, wait. They weren't in America. Sorry. I forgot about that. My, my Bible thinks everyone's white. <laughs> so have. there's he has the three sons. I shouldn't have and, made that joke. And then they have the three wives. And then all the different animals that they took on there, which is more than just two by two. Yeah, what a what a production. <laughs> All right, so up next after Abraham, I'm purposely not talking more about that because I don't have answers. <laughs> By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that was has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And then we'll get to Sarah here in a second. All right, so another huge player in the history of God's people, Abraham, right? He's like ridiculously old. <laughs> him and his wife. And God's like, I'm going to give you children and your descendants will be like the number of sand here, you know, in the desert. And it's obvious that him and Sarah are well beyond not only child bearing, but child rearing years. Like it, it, it's, it is like the end of the fourth quarter of their lives. <laughs> we are in the two minute warning. Like this shouldn't, you know, like it's probably dangerous for them to even engage in that sort of activity. Cause they might, <laughs> they might die in the process of trying to make a baby. You know what I mean? Um, but nonetheless, this is what happens. And it's to the point where God tells them this, right? And they start, you know, they get busy because God says to, and Sarah doesn't have a baby and she doesn't get pregnant and she doesn't get pregnant. And she's finally like, you know what? Why don't you sleep with my, you know, my associate here? And Abraham sleeps with what's her face? Hey, Carl. Yes. Thank you. I was thinking Rahab. I was like, that's not right. <laughs> And then, you know, Ishmael's born and there's that whole other deal that, that God redeems. But like, there's enough time between when God tells Abraham and Isaac is eventually born, that they have enough time to be like, okay, we've been at this for a while. And what God said would happen isn't happening. So we're going to take it into our own hands, which I think right there is in and of itself an incredible story that our impatience for God to do what he said he would do can lead us to taking things into our own hands. That, I mean, that's like, that's a whole sermon series right there. Abraham and Sarah being a prime example of this, but like not the only ones by any stretch. I, th I think there's times in both our lives, Dave, where we could look back and say, we got impatient and we took the reins and tried to make things happen. Now, I, I've never, you know, I've never had the, the burning bush moment, you know, or the, the schematics provided by God that Noah got that you mentioned earlier. Like, that, that hasn't happened to me. But 
it is, I think it is a very human thing for our impatience to supersede our faith and for us to then take unwise action born out of our impatience as opposed to remaining patient in our faith. Then there's this this weird thing here in verse 10, where he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Do you remember any part of that story between God and Abraham in Genesis where anything like this gets mentioned? No. Yeah, because I, I don't either. And, and really, this is I, we've had this conversation before in terms of you know, Abraham being held up as a person of faith and an example and is an example to follow when he really kind of jacked the whole thing up. Yeah. And and like, again, it kind of even goes back to what, what I'm saying with Noah. And <laughs> I guess if 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 I could say anything, there there's just this element to me of None of us are going to get it right. <laughs> like we have such this such this idea of perfection, and such an idea of I like I don't even know where it comes from. Because <laughs> as you look at these people of faith, they all screw it up. You know, even Cain and Abel. Mm-hmm. We talked about it last week. Yeah. It would be great if Abel did exactly what he was supposed to do, and then he became a hero of faith. But no, he died, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then Noah, he gets a he gets a blueprint for what to do. And and again, I don't know. I don't know him. I didn't experience what he experienced. But I'm kind of like, I I would hope that if God gave me such clear direction about something to the point where he was like. And here's the here's the blueprint for it. I would do it. And then you take Abraham and this whole, you know, promise for him. And he takes, like you said, he takes matter in his own hands because he doesn't wait for God. And I'm guilty of it. But. And, and, and this is this is, I think, been a central theme for me throughout my faith, throughout the time we've done this podcast is we serve a big God. And we put an awful lot on ourselves and our ability to quote unquote do the right thing when this this word faith there is just this element of we can't do it on our own Mm. there is this element of and, and, and I hope this is fair to say blind trust in the God we serve because logic goes out the window. Human effort goes out the window. You know, we faith is about serving our God and trusting him. And even in the clearest moments, even in the most direct of directions, even when it's, I've heard it and you've heard it, you know, Abraham and Sarah both heard it. They're both kind of, I mean, they're partners in this, mm-hmm. you know, you would think that a husband and wife hearing the same thing from God would be like, okay, we're <laughs> going to stick to this. Like we both heard it. We both know that God's going to tell us yeah. God's going to fulfill this. They still kind of screw it up in all of this. Kind of. And so to hold these people up as the pillars of our faith, you have to, we have to acknowledge their human fallibility in all of this and just God's sovereignty and his awesomeness in all of it. Yeah. Because he is bigger than us. He is an awesome God. And that is why we worship him and we serve him and long to be with him because he is good and we are incredibly grateful for that. So. 
So, yeah. so, so, listener, so you and me, everybody, we should take some sense of um, comfort in this. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's, because we inherently play the comparison game, right? That's just unfortunately part of human nature. Am I, mm -hmm. am I smarter? Am I better looking? Am I more charming? Am I more educated? Do I have more money? You know, yada, 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 whatever, right? <clears throat> Sizing people up as it were. And we love to like dunk on the Pharisees, right? When we're reading like, wow, what idiots were the disciples? And they're like, oh my gosh, who is this guy that he can, well, he's Jesus, you idiots. Uh -huh. And it's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would have been equally in the dark and confused about what was going on had I been there. And I tend to think I'm a rather smart guy and I would have been just as, Oh, what's scared? I don't understand. You know, all of that stuff. Um, and, and like, to your point, like you brought up, you know, so Abraham has a spouse approved affair with Hagar, right? You got him. Who's a father of the faith and father of the entire, you know, people of God. And you got someone like David who sees an, attractive woman showering and goes, Ooh, you know what? I'll sleep with her. And then I'll have her husband brought back, get him drunk. So he'll sleep with her. And then he'll think that the kid is his and Oh, wait, then, okay. I'll just have him murdered. Then I'll send like, and these are people that are held to your point as like pinnacles of faith, uh, uh, mentors, role models, as it were, you know, and, and I have a particular, um, feeling about people that have affairs uh in my own uh you know history uh that i would think very differently of of someone who does that and that's my own thing to work through so if you are someone who has done that I, this is not my judgment on you this is this is my very cloaked statement on something that has happened in my life um which is probably not helpful and I probably shouldn't have said it. So forgive me. Um, but like to your point, like these are the people that we hail as role models, as heroes of the faith, even if we're going to get further on in Hebrews, you know, um, and they are flawed. And so to your point, we should take a bit of comfort in that. But I also think that there is this, um, what's the word? I'm, words are failing me today, Dave. I don't like it. I don't like it when I don't have the words that I want when I want them. I also think there's, there's this concept or this idea that by holding up these fallible, flawed people as heroes of the faith, it's one more way that God is saying, you need me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, the best that you have to offer is still broken and is still in need of saving and is still in need of grace and mercy and forgiveness and redemption. And so I think there's, I think there's comfort in knowing that the best of us is still flawed and that doesn't make the rest of us that are flawed uh, scum. But at the same time, I think that it's also a way of God saying, look, the best of you is not good enough to accomplish what Jesus accomplished. I've done it. It's taken care of. Have faith that I've redeemed you as well. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know a whole, about, a whole lot about Enoch, who we talked about earlier, because I do think he is one of the ones that, at least from what we know in the Bible, there's not a whole lot of dirt on him. <laughs> And then the other, the other one that, and I, and I find it interesting that he, I don't think he's mentioned in this, is Daniel and his cohorts, because those are those are the two that 
you know, as, I, as I've looked at the Bible and people who have, um, I don't know, who are in the biblical narrative and, and, and God's story and what he did here with us, Enoch and Daniel are two that I do recall kind of having their act together. So I don't want to completely, I guess, just go to that place of, you know, there aren't some that maybe had <laughs> better spell. I don't know. Uh, it, 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 I, I don't want to undermine what you were saying in terms of we are dependent on God, regardless of who the, 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 the people, the human beings are that we um, hold up. Well, yeah, so there's there's... <laughs> There's that part too, right? Like <clears throat> the best of us are flawed. So we need God, but also the best of us are flawed. So we need to look elsewhere mm-hmm. for direction, you know? So like, like I think of, you know, all of the pastors in the last 20 years that have had their, scandals come out right i think of like rob bell and mark driscoll and perry noble and like all of these guys that were held on these giant pedestals uh what's his face from rillow creek um bill hybels yeah like these people that for so long were just esteemed and held as like these just oh just these great men of faith and not to say that they didn't have faith but they're flawed and their flaws came out in ways that caused people to rebel because of the 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 light in which they were held, which was these are like holy perfect men. No, they're not. They're flawed people. Our sh- our focus should have been on God and not on Bill Hybels as my savior, or you know Rob Bell or Mark Driscoll, or like like at, the list goes on. Uh, Carl Lentz in in Hillsong, New York, just like not good stuff. Just bad all around. And so I, I think about it that way too, is like, who is our focus on? Who is our, who are we allowing that place in our life of, this is who I look up to. This is who I get my meaning from. This is who I learn from. This is who, who gives me my sense of worth. Is it, is it another human or is it God? Because if it's another human, we're going to get let down. That's the that, the good side of the coin is being let down. The bad side is getting burned hard. Yeah, you know. But none of that happens with God. So, like, there's yeah. there's there's two ways to approach that part. I think. Yeah, and and I think too the other pieces is, you know, even these people who have had a downfall, it doesn't mean that they weren't seeking God to the best of their ability. Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't mean that they didn't have an impact on the kingdom. And it doesn't mean that they won't be there. And it, and it doesn't mean that God can't use them again either. Exactly. But we, Oh, write them off and stick them in a corner. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and that's, you know, I think it's a little bit of the American way. We like to we like to build you up so that we can knock you down again, you know. Yep. But it, yeah, it, it it certainly is a um don't question their salvation, don't question their value in the kingdom. But again, it's like you said, where are we putting our focus? Where are we you know, are we looking to human beings to meet our needs? When really it's, it is only God that can do that. Yeah, for sure. All right. So just to carry on, so we don't skip over any verses by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised, you know, just a giant miracle there. Um, And again, she laughed when she heard it, you know, (laughs) She's recorded as laughing at God uh-huh. when she heard what was said. And again, 
That's not no judgment on my barber because no, I don't have a filter. I don't. Yeah, I don't have a filter (laughs) either. So you know, that's case in point, right? So yeah, she laughs. God still moves. Miracle happens. Gotta love it. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, which might be one of the best qualifiers in the entire Bible, uh, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable, innumerable, sorry, grains of sand by the seashore. So God does a miracle, and the fallout is an incredible number of people from one situation, much like God does. Then we turn the corner. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. That, my friend, is a loaded sentence. Amen. Yeah. So when he says these all, I'm assuming he's referring to Sarah, Abraham, and Noah as the people. Yeah, and maybe even back. Oh, Enoch, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones that he and Abel and all that, yeah. So all these people that I just mentioned died in faith, not having received the things promised, right? So they died their bodily death without, like Abraham did not see his descendants in the millions. He saw them probably in the double dozens, digits, maybe. Yeah, double, yeah, dozens, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe. Maybe a dozen, (laughs) right? So they saw the beginning of the promise, but they didn't see the fulfillment of it because the promises were just so darn big. Mm -hmm. But having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles, on earth. So they got to see a glimpse of it. And then they also, this, this is an interesting, interesting statement, right? They were strangers and exiles on earth, acknowledging that they were made for somewhere else. This idea of heaven, right? Which is very interesting because this is pre Jesus, all of these people by a really, 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 really long time. And the whole idea of the resurrection was foggy at best for certain parts of Judaism and non-existent for others. And then there's verse 14. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. So I, I guess what this verse is saying is that people who speak about faith, who have this, this concept of, you know, what is it? Uh, say uh, things hoped for the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen is that well if I have that then that means there's going to be a a point in time where I see that faith come to fruition there's something else there's another place another time when I'm going to see that And then in 15, it says, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I am not a scholar on these verses. This is causing me to think quite hard and quite fast. But... This idea, so there's this this concept, right, that C.S. Lewis is famous for um, talking about, that, like, the reason, and I'm going to butcher this, so I apologize in advance, and, and Dave, if you have a better take on it, please correct me, um, th- like, this, this desire we have for things to be right, and for uh, faith, and for goodness all points to 
a place that is not here, that, that there is a heaven. Like our desire for things to be good and right and loving and all of that sort of stuff points to this, this God-shaped hole, right, that, that leads us to uh, this is not our final destination. There has to be something beyond this because our desires are for something that this is not. And we should not have those desires if everything here is just by accident. If everything here is just survival of the fittest and, um, you know, the, the strong survive and the weak die off, then there is no reason that we should have an innate desire for something good and pure and right and perfect. Those desires don't make sense from that worldview. And so because we all have those desires, there has to be a place that we belong, that we come from, that we are currently not in. Mm -hmm. And so I I feel like that's what this is, is talking about in a sense. They desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And so I, I, my, my very um, unconfident stab at this is, is that we are being shown these people of faith not for their goodness or for their perfection or for their ability to do it on their own, but because they are flawed and in their in their flaws, in their imperfection, they still were able to have their faith persist because they knew there was something more. And God yep. was able to work with that faith to produce something miraculous on this earth. Yep. All right. Well, there you have it. That's I get nothing else to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly the, I think it's mere Christianity that, I mean, exactly what you just said of just, you know, if if this world can't meet what I desire, because I think desire is the key word. If this world can't meet the desires that I have, then clearly um, there's more. I'm created for a different world. I'm created for something else. Yeah. And so... um, uh, that is a very optimistic <laughs> approach. This is true. Uh, a hopeful approach, which we we've, we've also talked about, um, because you could take a very uh, you could take a negative approach. If this world doesn't meet my needs, well, then you know, screw it. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna contribute. I'm not gonna do anything. Uh, Lewis, well, and then but that's the people also, that we're reading about. That's also the point, too, right? It's like, right, yeah. If if this world doesn't meet our needs and God isn't real, yeah, then you better exactly. believe I'm going to get mine every possible chance I can get, regardless of the effect it has on other people. And I think that should be the natural response. And that's what blows yeah, my mind. That makes more sense. That makes way more sense. And that's what blows my mind about people that, that still value, like, you know, human rights and social justice and like all of the things that I as a Christian uphold because I believe that people yeah. are made in the image of God and they are inherently valuable. Like if you don't believe that, why why do you care what happens to someone that isn't you? Why yeah. why like if if this really all is just a giant accident and survival of the fittest is the way that species survive. Why should you not do everything in your power to climb the ladder so that you can provide for yourself, not even for your spouse or for your kids? Because that doesn't make sense either. Why do you love your children? You have no reason to love them. They're just there to carry on your bloodline, which, if we're all an accident, doesn't actually matter. The only thing that does in that point should be you and what's best for you. Yep. And that sounds really terrible, but that's well, and that's yeah, exactly. But <laughs> it's either that, or it's what the Bible says. Yes, and so many people live in this really gray area in between where they want to be morally good people, but have no reason to claim that a moral good exists, and it makes no sense. No. 
Yeah. Man, that, I don't know, that just really resonates with me more than it ever really has, because I just think about the number of places where I hear about people trying to make the world better. And again, what does it matter? You know, and then they, they would argue it's for the next generation. It's who cares? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You're going to be dead and gone and you will, in your estimation, stop existing. So who yeah. cares about the future? Well, and that's the thing. What does it matter if there's a hundred generation or there's 200 generations? It doesn't really matter just because there's more generations to live on this earth. whoop de do. Yeah. The, it, because there's, it, there's no point to life other than yeah. making the most of it while you can. And then it's over and then you're done and over you you cease to exist and you become a distant memory. Mm-hmm. It just, I, I, it, 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 it blows my mind that, you know, but it's a hard way to live. And so people have to, you know, muddy the waters as it were throwing in some morality and it's all, you know, culturally relevant, which is just a joke in and of itself. But yeah, it really, it really, um, and, and and Christians are are called you know hypocrites and and, and close minded, but you know that's a whole other <laughs> thing. Well, yeah, w- technically every human's a hypocrite, and technically every human's close minded. It just depends on when and where, you know. Uh, and 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 to think that that someone who believes that there is a God who created all of this on purpose and loves what he created despite its sinful nature and then sent his son to earth in bodily form to live a perfect life and die in place of that sinful creation so that that sinful creation could be made whole and pure and right again and enjoy eternal relationship with that God. For us to be the close-minded ones seems a bit silly when you put it in comparison to this was all an accident Mm -hmm. live while you can, but also why not just have moral obligations that make no sense to your worldview whatsoever? Yeah. We're we're definitely the closed minded ones for sure. (laughs) You know, that makes sense. All right. So all of our agnostic and atheist uh, listeners, you can write hate mail uh, to me and tell me why I'm wrong. Um, or I should, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that. That paints people of that viewpoint in a very negative way. And I should not have said it that way. I apologize. If you disagree, you can write to us however you feel like you want to write to us. Let's put it that way. I should not have been antagonistic. I apologize. See, Dave, I'm not perfect either. (laughs) <laughs> I'm a flawed man of faith. Amen. Me too. So that's going to be my, uh, what's on my tombstone, I think. But anyways, I think that brings us to the end. We got a little, <laughs> got a little, <coughs> not off topic, but a little excited there at the end, uh, yeah. which is okay from time to time. Um, but this will conclude episode 194 of the master class. Um, you can find your show notes, uh, in your podcast app of choice, or you can go to, uh, super megacorp.net slash masterclass slash one nine four. And the, uh, the links for the good stuff will be there as well as ways to get in contact and say, hi, should you uh, desire to do so? Um, until next time, Dave. Um, see you later. yeah, do something good. Okay. Go for the gusto. Yes. Go for, go for the gusto. <laughs> go for the gusto. I approved. <laughs> or I, appro- I can't even talk anymore. Okay. We're done. Bye. Bye.